Hello, friends. So good to be with you today. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We've been wrapping out this entire book. And uh, wow, it, what, what an amazing journey it has been. We've dealt with a lot of problems that we see come up. Uh, you know, I want to just say in the church then, but it really is, that, <laughs> that's, that's not limited to any particular time, is it? Some of the problems that we saw all through the book of Timothy, we find today, many of us in our workplaces, our churches, our, our communities, or in ourselves. And so he really addressed quite a few things and gave the solutions, or this is how we as believers should respond. Now we're in chapter 6, and we're going to deal with verse 1. He made this statement. He said, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of, of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Now that's just a real mouthful right there. And especially for us during this day and time, when we stop and think about people that were considered slaves, people who were slaves, and because that is so distasteful to us that we're trying to wrap our brain around what what that mean and, and why did Paul deal with it like this? Well, Although the concept of slavery is extremely distasteful to us, the institution of slavery was widespread in the ancient world, uh, and especially in the Roman world. I mean, it was widespread in the Hebrew world of the Old Testament, and it was also widespread in the Roman world of the New Testament. I mean, slavery uh, was everywhere. As a matter of fact, often, because I was thinking about this, slavery often came, to, came about because people were in debt, they couldn't pay off their debts, and uh, if your debts couldn't be paid, uh, we really didn't have the uh, governmental oversight like we have today. In those days, if you had a debt and you couldn't pay that debt, you became someone's slave until you could pay it off completely, and that was just how that worked. Uh, often, it was a result of being a prisoner of war. There was many times whenever uh, someone would go in in, a, in, in uh, the, the mode of war, and they would conquer a nation, and they would bring people out, and, and uh, they, they would make slaves of them. And as horrible as that was, the alternative was is that, uh, well, we'll just kill you, and uh, you can die. Or you can come, uh, you, you can come and serve uh, in my house or in my country or whatever the, there was. And then there were those that were, weren't taken in war, but they were kidnapped. Uh, that also took place an awful lot. We've, we've seen that throughout history. The Roman institution of slavery was not pretty at all. And we see a lot of that in kind of the movie Spartacus, where slaves begin to rise up and they begin to revolt, that type of thing. So verse one, Paul is looking at this community where slaves are a part of everyday life. And, and Paul realized that some of them were Christians. The, the slaves were Christians and also the masters, those who owned them, they were Christians. And, and so, so Paul, Paul said to the Christian slaves, he said, he said, I want you to be good, respectful workers for your masters. I want your attitude and your disposition, how you carry yourself, how you work, I want this to be respectful. And now listen to me, that was not at all and approval of the institution of slavery. The Bible has never promoted slavery on any condition. It never commands slavery, but what it did was is it took a situation where people were living and it basically regulated it and uh, tried to make it more uh, a more humane institution. And especially for people that were Christians, because you know as well as I do, and many slavery uh, conditions, there were brutal things that were carried out. But, but Paul was looking at this group where slavery was, was uh, instituted in, in, into their communities and had been throughout the entire Roman Empire. And, and Paul said, this is, you, as believers, you have conduct responsibilities toward those that are under you as well as those that are over you. And, and um, so Paul assumed, as a matter of fact, that, that he knew that the slaves to be a part of the Christian congregation. I mean, you might go into a church and you might find half the people in there were slaves. But what was also equally interesting was the fact that many times the slaves and the owners were there together worshiping God. 
Now, see, they didn't know it was any different. It was just it was a it was a lifestyle, and and so in in some cases, the slaves might even be an elder or or even a pastor over that church. I, I heard this, I, and I'm trying to process it. But in the entire Roman Empire, of course, the Roman Empire, I mean, they basically conquered the world. But there was an estimated, they said, 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire, which is just kind of hard for me to believe. And you can even look back at the Old Testament and you find that same thing. You remember Daniel, the three Hebrew children, and the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you remember them? They were carried away captive and brought into Babylon from another country. They were captured. And what the, what these countries would do is they would go through and just ransack this particular country, and they would kill everything. Or if they found someone to have value, then they would load them up and they would bring them in. We find that same thing with Joseph. Joseph was sold to a bunch of Ishmaelites that brought him up to Egypt, where he was sold in the house of Potiphar. So you can see that this thing has taken place, and Paul realizes that. And, and again, in our, in our day, it's, it's so distasteful, it's hard for us to even wrap our brain around what that looks like. But in those days, it was, it was something that was much more common. And so Paul was looking at it not necessarily from a natural revolt as to say we're going to have a physical revolt and rebellion, but he began to talk to people about their Christian and godly conduct as being in that position. And, and so uh, Paul's point is that as soon as you recognize basically that a person in your house or your work or whatever, your brother's sister, the, uh, when, you, when you recognize that person is your brother in Christ, your sister in Christ, suddenly it changes the dynamics of everything. Now, let, can I just bring this home to you? Let me, let me bring it home and make it a little more applicable. Just because your boss is a Christian you shouldn't expect favored treatment because that would be dishonorable. And if you're going to work for someone, if you're, if you're in a position to where you are beneath them and you work for them, there is a conduct that you as a believer, how you need to carry yourself because it brings reproach to being a Christian, to being a believer. There's so many times people say, yes, I'm a Christian. You know, they put fish on their business cards and all this other stuff. And then they go out and cheat people and rob people. And, and you're thinking, yeah, another Christian business. Don't do business with Christians. I've heard that. What a shame that that is. And Paul was talking to these people who were legitimately under the, under the thumb of people as being literally servants to them, slaves to them. And Paul made the statement. He said, when you are in that situation, you carry yourself in a certain way in an honorable way, because if you don't, it, it's not that you're going to overthrow the institution, but you're going to bring a reproach to your, to your testimony. It's important how you carry yourself, whether you be the master or whether you be the slave, whether you be the boss or whether you be the person that's been working for that boss. There's a conduct, that, that, a, a responsibility that rests on you as a believer. You know, and you've got to love one another, and you've got to treat one another with respect as a brother and a sister in Christ. Now, verse 2, he made this statement. He said, those who have believing masters should show them respect because they are fellow believers, because of that. And instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine your master? You you become a slave to them, and your master they you, you begin to see them through a different lens because you're a believer and they're a believer, and they become dear to you. You you begin to serve them with that light as fellow believers. He said, and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. In other words, I, uh, uh, somebody who is a Christian and they've got people working under them, they need to be devoted to them. They need to be devoted to their welfare because they're a brother and a sister. And so he was really dealing with that. And, and I, I think it's something that we could take a lot more time to go into that I'm not. But uh, I, I think he's really dealing with where you are as a, as a believer under certain circumstances. Somebody says, well, because I've got pressure on me and I don't like the situation that I'm in, I can behave any way I want. 
And that's simply not true. You're going to displease the Lord when you do that. You, 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 I, I don't care what circumstance. You may be in jail, but that jailer should be treated with respect. And especially because I've seen something. I've got a lot of friends in law enforcement, and I understand how things go in the jail system. I realize, I know that there are people who are corrupt, uh, corrupt uh, that are jailers and, and corrupt as prisoners. But as a, as a believer, your conduct, it behooves you to maintain a conduct that is representing Christ and not just your discomfort. And I, I know that's a difficult thing sometimes for us to process. But what Paul was really trying to do was he was dealing with the conditions of, of where these people were and telling them how to, how to act. You know, uh, the, that's a problem with the church is the fact that too many times they're, they're, they're answering questions that nobody's asking. You know, they're not dealing with how do I deal with this situation that I hate? I'm in bondage. I feel like I'm, and, and they're, they're not talking to you about how you conduct yourself, not when you get out of it, but when you're in the middle of it. You know, that tells a lot about you and your relationship with Christ as to how you respond when you're in difficult situations. How do you treat other people? How do you treat those that are over you? It says a lot about you. How do you treat people that are under you? My God, that says so much about you. And it's important that you carry and maintain an, an attitude as a servant of Christ, and especially as I'm working with people around me, that they are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and I need to give myself to them. They need to be dear to me. And, and maybe I can't change their environment necessarily with a snap of a finger, but what I can do is I can treat them with respect and I can treat them in a way that is honorable. See, those are the things that are really important. I don't, I don't care how many scriptures you can quote. When you begin to violate how you treat other people, you're, you're not worth much. You're just not from the kingdom of God standpoint. You know, as, as you begin to look even throughout the Old Testament, everything all the law hangs on one commandment, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The, the commandment of love is where everything hangs. And even the, the, the 10 commandments, all of them had to do with your conduct toward other people. Don't steal, don't, don't kill, don't, don't bear false witness. You know, it just, it goes across the board that the conduct that you have toward others makes the difference of what God's doing in your life. And if you, if you, if you, I, again, I don't care how spiritual you think you are, how much you think you know, if you don't walk in love, then all you are is religious. Um, all of the spiritual things apart from love is just religion. And love is the thing that changes it. That's why, that's the true definition of of who God is, is love. And so I, I'm, I'm pausing here just for a moment because this is so important for your life that you realize that, <clears throat> that you have a responsibility to those that are around you, those that are over you, those that are under you. Um, you know, and we can look at it and think, my, 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 look at those people. No, no, I'm talking about you, where you live, your boss, your situation, the people that are over you. What kind of respect do you roll your eyes when they say something to you? Do you, do you, uh, uh, do you gossip? Do you go behind their back and say things? That's, that is such an ungodly behavior. And it's no wonder that your life is in disarray. And so what Paul is doing is, is he's talking to Timothy about the attitudes. I want you to share these attitudes toward these people that are actually slaves or those that are masters. They both have a responsibility to each other. And you have that same thing. And, and so as Paul is closing out this book in Timothy, that's one of the first things he wanted to talk about because this is important. He did not want that to, to, to go uh, past him. Then he goes on into verse 3, and he starts talking about a couple of things. He talks about money. He talks about com contentment. He talks about godliness. And, and money comes into play. And I just want to say, money is, uh, is a very important part of your life because it um, uh, and and you have to understand that money money is just leverage. That's all it is. It's it's nothing. It's just leverage. 
uh, if you see it as anything else, you will lose your way. I'm, I'm just telling you. It's all it is. It's a tool. It's leverage. And God wants to bring leverage into your life because it gives you influence. As I can influence somebody, then uh, my life becomes more effective. That's my stewardship. So one of the tools that I have is wealth. So, so God is definitely interested in that. And you find here that there was some problems that was, break, that was coming to surface with uh, all of these Christians in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was a, a banking and a financial center for the whole region of, of the Roman Empire. Um, I'm just telling you right now that there was a lot of cash flowing through Ephesus. There was people that had a lot lot of money. But Paul, he's closing this letter by calling Timothy again to confront these corrupt leaders that had previously been there, and he exposes their motives. And he's talking here concerning money, because many of them, their motives for money, they were accumulating followers and, and uh, manipulating money out of them, high rates for their teaching. They were just, I mean, it was just, it was a terrible thing. And, and, and in essence, these people basically betrayed Jesus and his message of contentment and simple living. I mean, that's so important. So Paul here, he's instructing the wealthy Ephesian Christians, those that have become rich uh, in, in material gains, he's saying to them, I, I want you, to, I want you to, to rather be focused on being rich in good works, I, I think the bigger thing is to be rich in generosity. You know, I, I, we need to be, something I, I tell our church um, that I think is just essential. It is essential uh, for your life. It's a, it's a pattern, something that I think you just need to have etched on the wall of your life. You need to be extravagant in two areas. One is hospitality, and the other one is giving. You don't need to be extravagant in anything else, but you need to be extravagant in giving and you need to be extravagant in hospitality. And that's very important. And Paul basically is talking to these guys, I want you to be rich in good works, be rich in generosity. Um, and, and it really exemplifies people that have submitted all of their lives and their resources to King Jesus. And, and Paul said there in, in verse 3, he said, if anybody teaches otherwise and doesn't agree with the sound doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ and godly teaching, he said they're conceited. They're just conceited. They don't understand anything. Uh, they have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words. And here's the fruit of that. He said the result is envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant fractions between people of corrupt minds who've been robbed of the truth and who think that, that godliness is a means to financial gain. I mean, this is, this is a real problem. And, and so he's warning Timothy here against the argumentative heretics who leave the word of God and, and, and they've turned the focus on their own wealth. They've turned the focus on their own comfort. But Paul then stresses, he says, there is gain. Because first he says, he, he, he said uh, uh, that, that godliness, uh, people think that godliness is a, is a means to something. He said they're deceived. Godliness is a means to financial gain. And there's a lot of people, that's exactly what they think. Their, they, their ministry is a means to financial gain. They're, they're, because people trust them. You know, that's one reason why I don't uh, allow myself to be engaged in financial businesses where people who know me can connect with me. I don't ever get into the sales thing, the pyramid things. I don't do that. You know, if, if you buy this much, then you'll get so many people that'll buy this much. I, I don't allow that. And people have come to me with probably legitimate opportunities but I said, I can't do that. I, I can't be involved in that. Now, the reason is, is because people trust me. That, that's important to me. I, they would buy something from me because I asked them to. 
That's true. They trust me. And how, how could I ever violate that kind of trust for my own gain? That's, that, that's so inappropriate. When someone is a father, they give more than they take. That's the nature of a father. The nature of a pastor should never be to take advantage of, of the sheep that trust them, who find confidence in them. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect, and I don't think that any pastors are perfect, but we have a responsibility to guard ourselves in these areas because finance is so important in a person's life because it, it literally uh, positions them in life. And, and the amount of stress and problems that have arisen because of an interruption in their finance is just overwhelming. And so it's important for me as a pastor to make sure that you're stable in your finance. I'm going to tell you, don't do this. Don't buy that. Don't go in debt. Don't, you know, I'm, as a father, I would say, <laughs> quit it. No, stop it. Don't, don't, don't do that. But, but I'm in a situation here where I, I, I can never allow myself as a minister now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be critical of anyone else. You, you do your thing. I'm, just, I'm talking about me. This is just me. But I can never position myself in anything that would take advantage of someone for my gain who trusted me. I, I know so many people, I started to say ministers, but people also, they have a trail of dead and wounded behind them. And when I stand before God, I, I may have some things that, um, I may have some things that I stand guilty of. I'm, you know, I'm sure we all do, but I don't want that to be one of them. I, it, I, I want what's important to God to be important to me. And what's most important to God is his people, the sheep, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. That's most important. And God forbid that I should ever take the strength of my position as a leader, as a pastor, as, as, as someone who operates prophetically, as someone who is a teacher, that I should ever take the strength of my position to hustle anyone God forbid. And again, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not trying to point a finger at anyone. I, I, that's not my. That's that's above my pay grade. But I'm just talking about me. And but I I pray that you will take it to heart, that you understand that gain. Um, can be very deceiving. Bible says the, the, the deceitfulness of riches. Riches become deceitful when they become your source and you start looking to them thinking they're your source. They're not. That's just a tool. God's your source. And I don't care they can strip everything away from you that you've got. I don't care what it is. God's going to drop something on you straight out of heaven if he has to. He's going to do it. God's going to take care of you. He is faithful God is faithful. God is good. God never fails. He never fails. And you don't have to hustle anyone to get done what God wants you to do. I mean that. And and I, I uh, somebody might say, well, you, you can get off in the ditch. If I'm going to be in the ditch on something, let it be in the, my determination to protect you from my own greed or pride. God forbid that I should violate that precious gift of trust that God gave me. So a lot of people think that. Verse 5, they think that godliness is a means to financial gain. You know, you know, I just, and he's warning Timothy against the uh, argumentative people that are using the word to promote their own wealth and control, all of that stuff. 
And, and Paul stresses there, he says in verse six, he said, but godliness with contentment, I mean, he's making the statement. He said, he, he said that's not right. But then he says, yeah, but he, you know, he stresses there, there is gain with godliness if it's combined with contentment. Um, there, there's something about a discontented heart. It never has enough. When you take people... And many times that's expressed through through their what they spend, through, through wealth, through money. They can never have enough. I worry about people who are obsessed in pursuing wealth. That's their the, the obsession. It's a tool for God's sake. And and you can be deceived by it to the point that when you lose it, I mean, what do you do? What is what is the extent of your grief when your money becomes unstable? That finds where your trust is right there. Your, your trust, although I, my, I have trust in my, my resources enough that if something breaks, I have, I've, I have enough that I can get it fixed. But if I lost it all, if everything was stripped away from me, I have him. <laughs> That's my trust. That's, and, and, in that, and because of that, he can bring wealth into my hands. See, this is the problem with a lot of people. God would like to bring resources in their hands, but he can't trust them. <laughs> they, they get freaky and just, you know, uh, <laughs> I gotta buy 10 cars. I've gotta have this, I've gotta have that. And, and quite frankly, you don't need anything. You know, you need a plate of food in front of you. You need a bathroom and you need a place to sleep. That's pretty much all you need in life. But we have so jammed our lives with so much stuff thinking that that's going to make us full. And then when we get to, I mean, they could make you the king of the world. And when you got to the top of the mountain, you'd say, is this all there is? I mean, I'm, what, who was it? Alexander the Great that made the, he wept because there was no more nations to conquer. The, 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 the having more isn't going to give you the satisfaction that you're looking for. There's only one place you're going to find satisfaction, and that's in him. And so he said there, he said, he said, uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment is really the strength. Contentment is the wealth. I can be content. You know, maybe, maybe I'm not driving, uh, maybe I'm not driving a Rolls Royce, but I'm content with what I have. I'm thankful for what I have. I'll use it. And whenever I use it, if my resources allow me, I'll buy another or I'll buy something better. But regardless of what I get, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. The, the, the contentment that you have is going to be expressed through thankfulness. And there's some people, <laughs> that they're not thankful for anything. No matter what they have, it is never enough, never good enough. I got to have more. got to, you know, and it drives people. I see ministers that have absolutely left the will of God by trying to spread the gospel to the world. And they go places God didn't tell them to go. They do things God never told them to do. And most of it is because there's no contentment in them. And they're being driven somehow thinking that if I do more, then suddenly I'm going to be satisfied. And it's not. It's just not, guys. I'm just telling you. God's not impressed by what you do. He's not impressed. You know what he's impressed with? Your faith. He's impressed with your obedience. And he may not tell you to do all those things. You know, a matter of fact, can I just say this? Before you go do a bunch of stuff, before you buy, before you do, how about going to the Lord and saying, <laughs> saying, Father, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think about it? <laughs> and, and to the point that there's some things you need not do until you have a word from the Lord. Now, once I get a word from the Lord, man, it's on. We're, we're, we're going for it. Everything I'm throwing in when I have a word from the Lord. But is what I'm doing, is it driven by a lack of contentment? Is the ministry driven churches that have buried themselves in debt. They will never get out in this lifetime, ever. The only escape for them is death. They'll never get out of the hole they've dug in for, that they've dug for themselves. Build millions of dollars into auditoriums that nobody will fill. Dear God, I mean, we, we are so full of ourselves 
We're so full of ourselves. It's no wonder that we're in such a mess. Well, I believe in God. Yeah, I know it, but I just trashed the last 20 years of my life and the next 20 years of my life. I have become a servant to that bank for the rest of my life over because of lack of contentment. What if you don't have as much as somebody else? Do you think your worth is measured by what they have or because of your obedience to the Lord? And whether mine is more or whether mine is less, I bring it before the Lord and I say, here I am. This is what you gave me. And I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do with this. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm content. Uh, can I just pause? I didn't mean to get stalled up in that. But I just want to say this, this message to Timothy at the close of this book is so important that you learn what it is to be content. A discontented heart will never have enough. It will never do enough. It will never be enough. It'll never do it. And Paul made there in that statement, the next verse in verse seven, he said, you know, you brought nothing into this world, buddy, you're not gonna take anything out of it. I heard the story of the two guys standing at the grave and one looked over at the other and said, wonder how much he left. And the other guy said, all of it. <laughs> He didn't take anything with him. He said, we brought, verse seven, we brought nothing into this world. We're taking nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. <laughs> what? That's what I just said to you. We brought nothing into this world. We can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content. Now, do I want more? Well, yeah. And you know what? That's okay. If you want more, David said, to, or rather God said to David, you remember when David got messed up with Bathsheba? He said, I gave you your father's house. I gave you this. I gave you all of this. And he said, if it had not been enough, I would have given you more. Can I, can I just tell you that if, if, you, if you need more, go to God with it. He'll give it to you. But he said here, and verse eight, he said, if we have food and clothing, let's be content with it. Let's be content because he said those who want to fall into, those who want to get rich, he said they fall into temptation and, and a trap and into so many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. My goodness. And he said, for the love of money, is the root of all evil. It didn't say money is the root of all evil. Money is a wonderful tool. I hope you have more than enough to do what needs to be done. But the love of money, and you don't have to have a million dollars to have the love of money. I've seen people have the love of money that didn't have a dime, but they had the love of money and it drove them. And he said, the love of money is the, is, is the root of all kinds of evil. It opens up and he said, some people, eager for money. They wandered from the faith and they pierced themselves with so many different griefs. Obsession with the desire to be rich will warp you. It will because it opens doors. And I really believe that Satan takes advantage of those, those uh, unsatisfied dissatisfactions. You know, he he feeds off of that. And you give yourself over to thoughts and to feelings that turn to envy and jealousy over what somebody else has and you don't. So so bring your mind in control. There's nothing wrong with money. Money is a wonderful thing. I hope you get a whole barrel full of it. I, I do. But but that's not your source. It, the love of money opens doors to evil that you can't even imagine. And, and the most wicked, wicked, wicked people and devices that you probably have ever heard of have been manipulated by that, a love of money. And they'll kill for it. They'll manipulate, they'll lie, they'll deceive because they think somehow that's it and it's not. But then he, he, he turns to Timothy and says, here's the contrast. He said, but you, oh man of God, that's the contrast. Flee from this and pursue righteousness. Listen to me. Don't pursue money. Pursue right standing in the kingdom of God. 
pursue an understanding of what his covenant provides for you. Because I'm telling you, his covenant makes provisions for you that'll take you just about any place you ever need to go. Seek first the kingdom of God and being in right standing with him and all these other things are going to be added to you. Don't get this backwards. He said, all of those other people, they're pursuing money. He said, you pursue right standing with God, righteousness. I'm going to tell you something. Greatest thing that ever happened to me was many years ago, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I got a message given to me that established me in righteousness. I'm established in who I am. I know who I am. <laughs> I know who I am. I know who he is in me. Nothing else matters. In fact, everything else, I don't give a flip about any of that stuff. But it comes to me if I need it. I'm a, I'm, I'm a citizen of another kingdom. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I carry his word in me. And when there's a need, I go to the Father. And I'm telling you, he makes provision. Let me just tell you something. He's rich in money. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in kindness. You have a need. My Father is rich. <laughs> oh, my God. He's rich. So so anyway, look, I'm, I'm sorry. He... Oh, oh, man of God, <laughs> verse 11, this contrast, flee all of this and pursue righteousness. God, I can't say that. I can't say that without pausing again. Pursue righteousness. That's your key right there. Do you have needs in your life? I'm not saying don't, don't. I'm not telling you to go in there and turn on the television or flip on your video game, prop your feet up and don't do anything. No, you get busy. You get busy. God will bless what you put your hands to. Most people want to be blessed, but they don't put their hands to anything. But in your busyness, let the motivation for your life and the core of your being be seen in your pursuit of being in right standing with God. I'm in right standing with God. And that's an acknowledgement of my identity. I'm not some old sinner saved by grace. I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm, I'm born again. I'm a new creature. I'm a new species of being that never before existed. I am seated at the right hand of my heavenly father in authority and in strength and Jesus Christ is my Lord. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. That's what I'm pursuing. And when I and when I pursue that <laughs> Well, there it is again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, when, <laughs> when I pursue that, <laughs> when I pursue it, it engages the kingdom of God in my situation. <laughs> so I'm pursuing righteousness. That's what I'm doing. I'm pursuing righteousness. And he didn't stop there. He said, pursue godliness. Pursue faith. Pursue love, pursue endurance, and pursue gentleness. See, that's where all my focus is. It didn't say one thing about there. I'm trying to figure how you can make a million dollars off of somebody. No, he said, those things aren't your source. He said, rather, turn your heart to righteousness and godliness and faith and love. Turn your heart to endurance and gentleness. He said, fight the good fight of faith and take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made a good co confession in the presence of all those many witnesses. That's what he said in verse 12. He said, in the sight of God who gives you, listen to this, who gives you everything. I, I, I have to read that again. I have to read that again. Please bear with me a second. I realize maybe I'm going longer than I intended to, but please bear with me for a second. He said, he said rather than pursuing the, the riches that could deceive you, he said, verse 12, he said, pursue, verse 11 said, pursue righteousness and and, and all of that. And then he said, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith and take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
in the sight of God who gives life to everything. He'll give life to your business. He'll give life to your dreams. He'll give life to your hopes. He'll give life to your finance. He'll give, you, he'll give life to your relationships. God gives life to everything. And of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, being under great stress, made a good confession. And he said, he said, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, do you hear that? How important that that is, which God will bring about important. And then he made this statement, this, this proclamation about God. God, the blessed and only ruler the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and lives in unapproachable light, with, whom, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. <laughs> Dear Lord, that's so powerful. <laughs> wow, that is so powerful. Our motivation is from a focus on Jesus Christ. Dear God, my motivation is him. It's him. And so he said there in verse 17, he said, command those who are rich in this present world. And, and let me just tell you the way that said it, that, that kind of says there's an expiration date on that. <laughs> I mean, there just is. He said, command those who are rich in this world. Don't be arrogant or put your hopes in wealth, which is uncertain. But rather, he said, put your hope in God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. And I just tell you this, your enjoyment is important to God. And God will give you whatever you need to walk in that and to receive that. He said in verse 18, he said, I want you to command them to do good. He said, be rich. But let the focus of your rich be this. It isn't just more dollars in the bank. That's fine. But he said, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. That is a commandment worth putting on your refrigerator right there. Be rich in good deeds. Be generous and willing to share. Your, your, your life, your, your reputation should be earmarked by generosity and good deeds. Do you, do you hear me? Your life, your reputation should be earmarked by your generosity and your good deeds. And you need to be willing to share. That's something that's very important to the Father. And he said, in this way, not only will you sow seed here that will certainly bring about a harvest. I mean, what I sow, I'm, I'm going to reap. That is a principle that is truly laid up. But he said also, there's, a, there's another layer to that that you have to realize. He said, you're going to lay up treasures for yourselves as a firm down foundation for the coming age so that you might take hold of the life that is truly life. Certainly that applies to heaven. But when I give to the poor, when I give to, when I'm generous, when I sow, I lay a firm foundation for my life. And the coming age, as far as I am concerned, is the days in front of me of walking in the kingdom of God. And I'm laying hold of life now that is truly life. I don't have to wait till I get to heaven to experience that. I should be experiencing that right now. And then he said in verse 20, he said, Timothy, guard that which has been entrusted to your care. Can, can I once again reaffirm this to you? God entrusted something to you. 
It may be a talent. You know, to one he gave five talents, one ten talents. To one of them he gave one talent, but he gave them all something. He gave you something. And, and I'm, I'm going to use these words here. He entrusted you with something. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, an ability to sing. Maybe it's ability to govern. Maybe it's ability to give. Maybe it's an ability to, to encourage. Maybe it's an ability to preach or to prophesy. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you have an ability to, to go in where people are hurting and somehow change the structure of their life to where you can make their life a better life. You, you have an ability. There's something that you have that I don't have. I, I, God made us work, work many parts of the body. I'm, I'm just one part of the body. I can't do everything. I can't be you. No one can be you. But you have been entrusted with something. So, so what are you doing with that? And he said, you need to guard that. Don't flippantly toss that to the side. Guard that which has been entrusted to you. And he said, Turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. Dear God, to which some people have professed, he said, and in doing so, they've departed from the faith. They just lost their way. They did. They just lost their way. Every one of us know people who in their pursuit of things and, and, and misbehaviors, they lost their way. And he's saying, you're going to have to guard that. That that's that's not something. And in other words, if you have to guard it, that's something that is potential for the walls of your life to be breached in such a way that something could be taken away from you in that in that category. So you need to guard that. Guard that which has been entrusted to your care. And 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 he said, don't listen to a bunch of godless chatter and opposing ideas. Stay away from strife, contention, stupid things, and stupid people. <laughs> stupid is is as stupid does. I am telling you, you don't need that in your life because it will take you down a trail that will ruin your life. Guard your heart with all diligence, the Bible says, for out of it flow the forces of life. My God. <laughs> and then he said, grace be to you all. What a wonderful closing word. So 1 Timothy is really an important letter. It helps us gain a holistic vision of the nature and the mission of the church, I feel like, and what Jesus, what a, what a Jesus community believes, directly shapes how a community lives and uh, behaves in its city. How what, how you carry yourself affects the people around you, and that's the truth. So its theology and its beliefs have to be constantly critiqued and formed by Scripture, but mostly it's got to be drawn to the focus of Jesus Christ. He is, I'll say it again, the, the Bible is the menu, but Jesus is the meal. Everything, no matter what it is, anything, any doctrine, any belief, any, any teaching, when it, when it doesn't dovetail back into Jesus, then I think you just need to kind of shun it and, and shelve it. You really don't need it. And that's the truth. Um, Christians should be known for integrity, for service to the poor. They should be known for good works, for serving the poor and the most vulnerable of all, the, the widows and those others. And we do all of that out of devotion to the king. And that is what First Timothy is all about. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, this has been a wonderful study and I, I encourage you to go back and as you can, spend some time. Share this with somebody. Um, I, I promise you, uh, the, this teaching is very important for who, what we're doing and who we're becoming. We're growing. We're growing in knowledge, and and people need to hear it. And so, if you're going, you know, people I don't know. Your 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 feed's going to touch people that mine won't. And so, I'm asking you, please, please share this, and please leave a comment. It's so good to hear from you. Um, it it really gives me that opportunity for bond. And I see your name, and I begin to get used to it. And I want to say thank you for joining me. There's so many of you that have been so faithful in, in your relationship to me. And I appreciate that. I appreciate your friendship. I'll, I'll say it again. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you. It's, it's very meaningful. I love you guys. And I'm so looking forward to seeing you in the next chapter of the next book that we're going to encounter. I'll talk to you then.
Bye-bye.